I'm Kurt Grinnell from the Jamestown Sklalem tribe, and that means strong people. I'm a tribal councilman here, and I'm also the CEO of our aquaculture and seafood program. Right here behind me, we have Squim Bay, and this is where our original tidelands are for our new aquaculture projects. The elders will tell stories about the Dungeness River and the Elwha River and these other uh, streams that we have about all the crab and the shellfish and the salmon that we had all the different types that we just don't have anymore in those numbers where they could go out and get them at any time they wanted eat as much as they want without making them ill from toxins they remember all that it wasn't that long ago it's what is my mother's generation and generations before her they were all there during the times where they call them the good times just over here to the west of us is called the jimmy come lately creek and it was once home to thousands and thousands of, of chum, you know, chum salmon run. And it got down to about five, seven to 15 fish. I, as a Jamestown fisher, was a, a fish from 1981 to about 1995. And by that time, I wasn't able to really pay for my gas in the sockeye fishery. Our coho fisheries had been gone for years by then. Uh, we used to move from one fishery to the other, but coho were already gone. And then we moved into the chum fishery. And really, uh, for us, we couldn't sustain ourselves on just one of the smaller chum fisheries. So a lot of us went into, you know, shellfish um, harvesting and that sort of thing. But what it did tell the tribe is that we were in trouble, and it came quicker than we'd all really thought it would. And that's when we started uh, investing into aquaculture in the early 90s. We're our sovereign nation. And we look out seven generations and how do we feed our people? We don't feel that we are truly sovereign unless we can feed our people. So one of our other uh, cornerstones of our aquaculture program is finfish aquaculture. And currently we're down here at the Manchester site. We're partners with the University of Washington and NOAA. And we're growing sablefish here. It's a native species that we catch off the coast of Washington state. And we bring them in for brood stock and we we egg and, and milk them and uh, create our own uh, create our own fish right here on site. For the past five to six years, NOAA biologists from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle have been partnering with the Jamestown Scholem Tribe to develop technology for the aquaculture of sablefish in the Pacific Northwest. This currently involves a pilot study growing sablefish in net pens at the NOAA Manchester Research Station where the Jamestown, NOAA, and the University of Washington are rearing 10,000 sablefish to commercial size and then harvesting and processing them to determine growth rates, fillet yields, quality, and marketability. We're also looking at the potential environmental impacts of the net pens before, during, and after rearing of the fish in the pens. This is a study that's funded by the NOAA National Sea Grant Program and NOAA Fisheries with the intent of transferring grow out sablefish technology to the Jamestown tribe so that they can continue this at their own net pen sites. The sablefish are, are a very robust species of fish. They swim from say 3,000 feet all the way to the surface maybe to feed. And, uh, but they're a delicacy, they're a high value fish. And again, I get back to being how robust they are. They're very tough and uh, they can take conditions that some salmon fisheries just can't. And when I talk about uh, aquaculture being a cornerstone to feeding our, our tribal citizens, it's also to combat uh, obesity, diabetes, um, heart disease, everything that our tribes are suffering from across the United States right now. We're trying to get our tribal citizens to eat more tr nutritious and traditional foods. The other problem is is the amount of toxins in the in the wild fish that we're capturing. We're only really supposed to eat a certain amount of fish per day or per week because of the toxins that are in it. These fish here we feed ourselves and they're not taking those toxins in and so they're very clean fish. You know, you could eat these fish every day and and not have those impacts from the toxins. People ask us all the time, well, why are you doing this in the water? Don't you realize that, that the, there's fish waste? And uh, yes, we understand that there's fish waste, but there's also the, uh, the impacts of, of land-based systems too. Uh, people need to realize that they have many impacts. One of them is just the power supply uh, and the, the amount of space that it takes. You can only put so many adult fish in a tank and have them survive. And uh, when you talk about the impacts of land-based systems at this moment, they're very, very expensive to run too. 
an impact is that it's a way more expensive product for people to either try to purchase, meaning it's more of a, a, a high-end product where the average person can't afford to buy the fish, which is really uh, another uh, problem that the world supply of fish is having is, is it's priced out for the average citizen. We get a lot of questions about fish illnesses or, or sea lice. As far as sea lice goes, it's our, the amount of salinity we have in our water, it just doesn't really prove that we have a lot of sea lice in this area, Puget Sound. But we do worry about other diseases that are naturally occurring in the water. Our fish are clean in the hatchery, and so before we release them into the pens, we do vaccinate against two or three of the, of the most uh, common types of diseases they could catch. And so basically we don't have a lot of problems with diseases or them giving the diseases to natural stocks. One of the big questions we have too, how much extra food is on the bottom of, underneath the nets? I'd say pretty much the zero nowadays because we shut it off when they're done eating. I think as tribes, we do have a role to play in aquaculture. And, and certainly there's, there's a handful or more of tribes that are, that are well into aquaculture and, and, uh, and can more, more so than other entities conduct more aquaculture, whether it's on their reservations, um, whether they're uh, you know, granted permission more readily to, to feed their people. It, it is easier for a tribe as a sovereign nation in the United States to, to uh, move around a bit and, and get things done. It, we still have our own in-house people that uh, our own biologists, our own scientists that keep us in, in a straight line as far as you know, sustainability and to make sure we're not causing harm when we're, when we're uh, raising our fish or shellfish. But one thing that um, perhaps people know as a sovereign nation, when we start looking at food sources, they know we come in and we're serious. Something that we've been eating for a thousand or two thousand years here is no longer here. They know that we need to reach back find a way to, to bring those populations back, whether it's fish farming and, or whether it's restoring habitat, they know that we need to get the job done.